So part of the perks of being the host of The Blend is I get to interview amazing people, CEOs, cigar aficionados, influencers. But today I get to say, I get to interview a friend. A friend. Claudia Trejos, sportscaster, journalist, and probably the greatest title she has, mom. Mom, that's me. How are you, my friend? I'm doing so, so well. I'm so happy that I'm here. I am honored that you you thought, we always talk about this. We always talk about sharing cigars, and God knows we've done many things to be able to enjoy cigars in different places, perhaps not the best places, but we've enjoyed our cigars, and we always said, we got to do this. What I always appreciated about Claudia is she is a true cigar enthusiast in the sense that when we used to hang out, we covered some boxing events, Univision, Telemundo, all the places, the zone, all the good stuff. And I, she, I would always say, you know, I'm a big cigar guy. And she's like, oh, really? And she would literally bust out her travel humidor. <laughs> and it was like a mini cigar shop. It was, it was, it was shop trajos. And like, what do you, what do you want? I got it. I, I got Robustos. I got, I got Lanceros. I got Torpedos. Whatever, whatever you need. Yes. So I had to sort of convince her that I am, you know, worthy to be able to purchase and not purchase, to be in shop trejos. No, no, dude, you've convinced me from day one. Because the truth is, Moreover, we have a lot in common. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I'm not Cuban, there's a lot of Cuban in me, hence my daughter. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we like cigars. We come from Los Angeles, so we have a right. we have this symbiotic sort of almost like 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 like, like a brother and sister kind of thing was, going on. When you said a friend, I was gonna say I'm like your Colombian sister from another father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'll, you know, you buy that? I, I would I would almost say from another mother because you don't know my dad. <laughs> well, but, uh, well, okay, fair, fair from another father. Okay, cool. All right, so let's let let's start from the beginning. Obviously, Colombian. What is what, when did the cigar come into your life? What moment made you go, ah, bueno, this is for me? You know, I don't think I had a choice. As we were growing up, my dad would take us walking on the. Um, we would we would have coffee plantations, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you know, there's this little gnat especially when the fruit is ripe and they're very annoying. And the only way to get rid of it is while smoking a cigar. Wow. So you'll see everybody walking down the, the, um, the Los Sembra, exactamente. So what happens is your dad, as you're little, they'll blow smoke over you so the gnats won't mess around with you, but you get older. So as you're getting older and then, you know, the typical, you go take care of that side over there and it's like, dude, okay, take one. And then from one, you know, by the age of nine, I was already smoking one. And I wasn't as sophisticated, and my dad wasn't that sophisticated either. Right. We just had literally home rolled cigars. Why? Because, you know, you, you circulate the, the way you plant. It's you have coffee and you have plantain, and then you would have cigars, and then you would have, you know, la mata de tabaco. Right, right. So it was like, it was rolled by the headmaster at the finca. So I, we didn't have that sophisticated palate. So moreover, I come to Los Angeles and then you start, oh, do you smoke cigars? Of course I smoke cigars. Sure. Oh, so here it is. And then, you know, you start, you know, educating your palate. Was that, you know, being, being a, a female, like you, the thing about you is you have decided to take, I think the hardest path, in other words, to be a female, to be an attractive female in cigars, boxing, journalism, Latin media. I mean, you know, are you, are you, Anglo media. Anglo media. Is, <laughs> is it something that that it just do you enjoy that? Where does that come from? Where does that drive to be the best, to be the first? What, where, and I'll get into what the first means. Where does that come from? Where did that confidence come from? You know what? I don't think there was confidence. I just didn't know I couldn't do it. Does that make a difference? I I did not know I couldn't do it. I mean, the fact that I was a female, Hispanic female, in my job description, it didn't say you can't do this. Right. So why not? You didn't see the glass ceiling. You just, no. you just kept walking. Uh, yeah. And kept and I, growing. Yeah. And I crashed a couple of times. So I just said, oh, there's a nick and okay, I got a cut here, but okay, move on. Well, growing up in Los Angeles, you know, you were the first, let me see if I get this right. You were the first female sportscaster in English. And oh, by the way, a Latina. Mm -hmm. And and for as diverse as Los Angeles is, that was like crazy. People were losing their minds to see. Oh, you were there to see a Latina yes. doing sports on a local station. Pe people weren't ready for that. No. 
And how was that? How was that? I mean, I mean, tell me about that when they said, okay, Claudia, you're going to do this. Okay, remember those days when you just have a long day and you just want to smoke a cigar and drink a scotch? I had many of those, especially Monday night, because by the time the LA Times would come out, be published, you remember this, my dear friend Larry Stewart had ripped another butthole. <laughs> and I'm sorry I'm using that, but you know, so there was a time when you, I literally had nothing else to do. And there was no social media, there was no way to defend myself. So what do you do? You just sit and you just do it better. Because at the end of the day, I will never forget the first time I had a chance to sit and speak with this gentleman. I said, as far as I'm concerned, my English is far superior to your Spanish. As a matter of fact, let me add the fact that I speak French and German and you, ah, you only speak English. So sorry. Right. But it take, you know, it's like that fire within you. Mm -hmm. But it, we didn't have the opportunity. It was, it literally fell on my lap and I had to run with it and I was going to make the best of it no matter what. Well, I, I don't want to use the word failure because I think, I think it's, it's, it's a, it's a, Challenge, in other words, so the channel, the the local thing in LA didn't work, and then, but it made you stronger and better. Exactly. And then all of a sudden, you go to national stuff. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, the little the little Colombian girl who maybe didn't speak English well enough, all of a sudden, is now on major networks covering boxing and stuff. Exactly. Where did the love for boxing come from? You know, I remember I must have been about five or six years old and I saw this beautiful, beautiful, tall, gorgeous man beating the crap out of people. And it was a perfect combination of power and, and speed. <laughs> and of course, it was Muhammad Ali. And he was like cleaning house. And then eventually you grow up watching Kid Pambele and then uh, Manos de Piedra Duran and Happy Lora. And we were very proud of Happy Lora. So, and, and mind you, I'm too short to play basketball, even, even though I was a point guard. Even with those heels? Even with these heels, yes. Even with those heels? Even with these heels, <laughs> yes. But that, that's where the love for my heels came around too, because I was so short. And, and trust me, as, as a person who appreciates heels, thank you. No, you're very welcome. You know, this, it's every girl deserves whatever shoes they want, period, full stop. And if they don't get That's them, the tweet, stop. Yes. <laughs> That, that's it. But I remember that clearly. And I remember thinking, um, going back to that fire within me, I, I was a bit aggressive, you know, uh, being 5'3 on a good day and playing basketball. You need to make your own space. You know, you learn to just you use your elbows. And, you know, when you land, you open your legs and you just want to be sturdy. That was the physical part. The physical part was always there. Spiritually and mentally has taken a little bit longer to catch up. You're also a motivational speaker. Yes. So all these challenges in your life helped you. When you see women in the industry, I mean, what, what is the state of women in journalism? Women in general, we've had, we've had the Me Too's, even in the cigar business, because it's such a male-dominated business. Are, are we making some sort of headway? I mean, what, what, what do you tell to a woman, a little girl, my little nine-year-old? Yes. My little nine-year-old January who says, I want to do this. What do you tell her? Do it. That's it. Do it. And, and I was thinking about this as I was driving to see you. I remember when people said, but why are you going to do that? It's so different. I said, because it's so easy to just stand or sit in the sidelines and be critical of those that are making things happen. But if you just stay there, nothing is ever going to happen. So I took the ball and I ran with it. And it's tough. I'm not going to say that it's easy. I'm not going to say that, you know, it's all peaches and cream, especially nowadays with, with the social environment that we're living, the political, the financial, COVID. A lot of things are part of this. But if you don't grab the ball, nothing will ever happen. So I want to say I'm not taking one for the team. Trust me. I'm not taking one for the team. I'm doing this for me because nobody else is going to do it for me. Now, as I'm doing it, I am happy to see that more ladies are following. And I'm not here to tell you as a motivational speaker, you're going from A to B to C and this is what you're going to do because everybody has a different path. But just understand that your path is that much more important for your growth. Don't do this because Pepito Perez out there is looking at you and criticizing you. Do it because of your own growth in your own way. But you do you. That's amazing. All right, so we're our cigar show. Let's talk some smokes here. Yes! 
1502 cigar. What are you smoking there? I'm having a ruby, uh -huh. and it's phenomenal. It's smooth. It's, uh, it's, it's. I'd say it's in between between a rubio and a maduro, but it's nice and spicy. And I like spicier things, as you can imagine. So I, I, I take hard liquor. I, I like. I, I'm a woman of high. Of sabor. Pero sabor intenso, intensity. Right. This is what I would call that. Smooth and intense. All right. So how do you develop? The thing that fascinates me is as a person who's in the cigar industry, and I say that humbly, I'm just merely yes. walking through enjoying hanging out with cigar folks. How did you develop your cigar palette? How did it come to you? The, the only way I found... Uh, my cigar palette is trying cigars because what you does, said. Does food help? Does does liquor help? Does wine help? Liquor always helps. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> liquor makes when the world doubt, go round. A, I'll drink to that, girl. Salud. Salud. Because God knows we have. Salud. Yes. Mm. But but see, just like one time we used to think of uh, wine as being a complement to a meal. Yes. So is a cigar. A cigar, you know, you can find like the undertones, the chocolates and the strawberries and, you know, the cinnamons and they're all there. But you don't get to really understand until you try. This is my first time having this. And this is fantastic. Amazing, right? Yeah, beautiful. From Nicaragua, the wrapper is actually Colombian, which makes me even more proud. But yes, of course. But again, like in anything in life, Jimmy, how many times have we sat down and talked about we should try this out? Right. And, you know, people will come and say, why are you going to try that? Why not? Why not? Right. What We got to try it. So in cigars is, t I remember back in the day, and we were just sharing that before we went on the show. Um, everybody just thought that there was a one place where you could get good cigars. Today, that is not the case. So why not open your palate? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because, I think it's a great because thing. Because now that every... Juanajito, every 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 Baba, every, every Frank, every every corner you can get a cigar. I, well, I think that's good exposure-wise. Is that bad too? You think? I don't think so because like, cigars like wine. I remember back in the day when I was uh, old. I'm not gonna say how old I was. <laughs> we used to drink wine from a box for God's sakes. We didn't know any better. Right, right. But we drank because that's what there was. Exactly. So the same goes for cigars. Why? I'm going to go into the financial end. Those that are having the mom and pop shops that are, you know, they have their own little Vegas and wherever it is that they have it, they deserve to make a living too. Sure. So, and if you cannot afford those very high priced, very exquisite cigars, they deserve to have good cigars that sure. are made at home in the local Vega. Why not? That's where I started. So I'm not going to shade on that at all. I think there's space for everything. And, you know, why not one day you can save up and then I've had people spending a lot of money in one stick. God bless them. They can't. Not everybody can. Right. Well, and first of all, shout out to Enrique Sanchez, CEO of GPC yes. 1502 Cigars for this. And my friend Maciel Prieto for the My Father Cigar, El Centurion. Sí. My, shout out y to sabes her. Que, you know, another one that I would like to share with you, Oscar Valladares mm -hmm. from Honduras. I mean, brilliant, you know, like the Superfly, the Super Oscar. I just love the name Superfly. I, Superfly, I, I, yeah. I think of Jimmy Snuka hey, come, <laughs> coming off the top rope. <laughs> well, the first time I ever got introduced to Oscar, he, he, he was like, oh, I, it, it's a Superfly. I'm like, yes, brother. <laughs> yes, brother. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, he started like that, too. Right. Because not everybody has the, the you know, the abolengo or the sure. legacy of Artu, un Arturo Fuentes, un oh, Padrón. And that's how you... Let, let's go back to our world. We started at the bottom of the totem pole. Sure. Well, I was carrying cables back in the day, but, you know, somebody saw a little bit of talent in me and gave me the chance to grow. Right. These homemade Vegas will eventually grow. It's just like little restaurants. Back in the day, either you went to a Michelin, like a one-star, two-star... I've never been to a two-star Michelin right, restaurant. Right. But, you know, I saved my money to go to a one-star. But that chef decided to walk away and create his own menu and be his own executive chef. You got to give those a, a little bit of chance and a lot of credit. I will say this. I, I went to dinner with Claudia in New York. Ah, uh, yes. It was the greatest story 
Everton. And we, we got to tell the story. So, yes. So, so we get there, and Claudia, we were covering a boxing event in New York City. So, first of all, it's New York City. I should have known better. We should have known. We and, should and, have known. We, and so, we meet her out for dinner, and the chef comes out, right? Yes. And says, Oh, no, 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 no. We got you. We got you. <laughs> to me, Jim Rodriguez, a little fat boy from LA, you got you means free. It wasn't you got you means free. No, I think, thank goodness, they're still there. They're still there. I thought about leaving one <laughs> just to pay maybe a third of the bill. When they tell you to order off the menu, don't. Don't, please don't. <laughs> but, but, but with that being said, hands down. It was great food. It was phenomenal food. I mean, we had an escargot and we're like, we're like, some people didn't even know what that was. The best part was when they put down the tab, you know, there was like 10 of us. It was $450. So we're thinking, oh, we're getting the Claudia's owner friend discount. Yes. $450. And so we all put in, you know, 40 bucks, you know, and, and then all of a sudden the guy goes, oh, no, no, that was the liquor. And then he turns over the tab and it was like, Ridiculous. Let's have him show. And our, our, our good friend Ricardo Celis, who's, who's, a, who's a broadcaster as well, we got to have Ricardo on the show. His quote was, Well, does this include the tip? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm wondering what tip? The front or the back? The tip is don't order off the menu. Yeah, no kidding. It's but, New York City. It's New York City. We were in the middle of a very highfalutin area. And, and yes, we were actually, the chef came out and he is, he actually, have you ever heard of Leal? Lezal. Mm -hmm. He was the chef for Lezal for many years. So obviously he's starting this place and he's like, come, come over. Yes. And of course we're the zone. Well, then went the per diem. The per diem for, for, the, the, next, for the next three remotes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So so let's talk quickly about boxing. Yes. Okay. Jake Paul. Oh, Jake my Paul, God. Jake Paul, YouTuber, gets almost $700,000 to beat up an ex-MMA guy. Mm -hmm. Over a million pay-per-view buys. 1.5. 1.5 pay per -views. As a boxing commentator, analyst, scribe, your thoughts are? Good for him. Yeah, right. Good for him. Good for the sport, bad for the sport. You know, it just brings a completely different fan base. So we, we got to live in this century. The millennials are, uh, they have a completely different attention span, different interest. And, you know, the truth, I, I'm going to, let, let's go for demographics. The millennials will inherit this, what we're leaving. And they Sorry. Need, Yes. <laughs> Sorry. But, but but let's be clear. Uh, let's not even get into his personality or whatever goes right or wrong. The truth is he has all those eyeballs. And sponsors need those eyeballs. Let's be clear. That's how you make the money. Now, with that being said, is it good or bad for the sport? I think it brings a completely different demographics to the sport. Those kids. Which is good. Yes, it's good. Because you know how many years we've heard boxing is dead? MMA is taking over. No, there's enough market for everybody. Absolutely. But my thing is this, if I'm, if I'm in boxing, I'm pissed because this is an indictment of boxing. Good for Jake Paul, good for you, my friend. No hate at all. But the fact that he's getting a million, over a million pay-per-view buys is an indictment of boxing. And I know that's your love, that's your sport, that, that's your horse in this race. But that's unboxing, isn't it? So what's first, the chicken or the egg? Do we serve the public that's watching us or the, the public that watches us determine our market? Well, I think, I think people want to see fights. And the thing about MMA, and, and, and we talked to this with, with Campbell McLaren from Combate Global, is the thing about MMA is you're going to see the fight you want to see. Maybe less than a year. In boxing, you don't see that. So, but now it's not the sport itself. Now we're talking about politics in the sport. That has absolutely nothing to do with and the, in the end, sport that's, itself. Whether it's Top global, rank. But, I, I mean, and I remember back in the day when you and I were working together, this has been an issue for the last 15, 20 years. This is nothing new. We've always wanted the best facing the best. But when you control 
the talent that you have to work with, mm -hmm. like Combate, like UFC, I'm gonna say it. Yeah. You can actually pin the best against the best. But when you have boxing and you have all these different fragments and you're watching over the well-being of fighters and not well-being, I'm talking about their humanity, I'm talking their financial well-being, their record well-being, because that all comes into play. So that's a completely different animal. That has nothing to do with the sport itself. But with that being said, when we're talking about Logan Paul and Jake Paul, let's be clear on this. They did fight. Right. Did they fight Pepito Perez from down the street? First. Second, when you have a 3-0 fighter, even if he's a, uh, an amateur uh, background and he's training with Freddie Roach, they are kept as well. They're being looked after. So why are we shading on somebody like the Paul brothers? Because they're being looked after when they are already bringing this 1.5 million people watching them. You and I were there in Miami when we had this fight right before the, the Super Bowl, when we had two, two championship fights. And once the Logan brothers were done, everybody left. Everybody left. So it goes to show again, we have the sport itself is so fractioned. Mm -hmm. And I'm, let me rephrase that. It's not the sport itself is the, the, the powers that be the ones that determine who is worthy and who's not the ranking system. When you don't have the control over everybody, that's what's going to happen. We're not talking about an organized sport like the NFL or NBA or baseball for that matter. Baseball I, is perhaps one of the best organized leagues hands down. So again, when you have minor leagues and everybody's like being honed and, and worked in and then brought into major leagues, we don't have that in boxing. NBA has the CBA, has college sports. Everybody gets honed in and brought in. You have that right in front of everybody. You're honing talent. I remember when Canelo Alvarez was 5-0. Right, right. And now he, people still look at him like he's second-class citizen. Why? Why do people hate Canelo? I mean, Canelo, all that dude does is, is train, he's married, got his kid, doesn't get into trouble, doesn't beat up his, his, his women, uh, doesn't, get, doesn't get drunk, doesn't crash into cars. Why do people hate Canelo? That's why. <laughs> There's no street cred. That's why. So to me, that's more on us. I'm, I'm gonna, and I'm going to throw you under the bus, Mr. Jimmy. Okay. Uh-oh. Porque you're Cuban. Right. You know, and you right. don't look Cuban, you don't no. sound Cuban. No. And how much hate do you get? I, I get a lot of hate. Uh -huh. I get a lot. Made in America with Cuban parts. Exactly. Yeah. And you will forever be the white boy. Right. right. In our in our in our Latin, it, uh, Jimmy Rodriguez. I mean, it doesn't. Jaime Rodriguez, for God's sakes, it does not get any more Hispanic than that. But that's it, because he's not scandalous. Because what I don't know if even his most controversial comments are very subdued, very like, um, yeah, and I get it as a journalist, he's not sexy as a journalist. He's not, because he doesn't say anything. He's not going to say anything, but, and that's fine. That's fine for us. That's fine for, for the regular people. But the guy, the guy doesn't do anything. We, we should be praising this guy. We should be praising him. We should but be. Again, that's on us now. I, I, yeah. But I go back to millennials. Let me rephrase this. What makes the news? What goes viral? What do kids watch? Yeah, they don't say, hey, Canelo got up today, ate two eggs, worked out, kissed his wife, and hugged his kid. That doesn't make the news. It's Fulanito hit his wife. This guy got a DUI. That guy you know what? this. I, and I'm not shading on Errol Spence, perhaps one of the strongest forces at 147. For, for us lovers of the sport, he was a common name. We handled Errol Spence. When did he become a household name? When the accident when happened. When he flipped his car. Exactly. That gives you a very good idea of where the mindset is. So you're right. It's on us. Yeah. Before I let you go. You're going to let me go already? Before I let you go. No, no, no. Uh, trust me. You're always within, within reach. Better be. Before I let you go, what is your favorite and with all due respect to Enrique's 1502 which I know is skyrocketing no, up no, the chain. No, no, this is beautiful. It, that, look at that. I'm not I'm not What is your go-to cigar? You 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 finished the night. Oh. You're sitting back. We've all everything's been put to bed. Everything's on the air. You've got your drinky drink. What is your what is Claudia Trejo's go-to? Romeo Julieta's hair is for. Why? What does that do for you? That's actually like my go-to because it's nice and light. 
and uh, it's smooth, it's silky, it's got a creamy undertone, and it's just, it just brings me, my, my energy levels down, and sometimes I need that. And that's what, that, that's what, if you come to my humidor, that's what you, you're going to have to, we're going to have to do a tour of the, por favor, it'll be my pleasure. Mi casa, tu casa. Well, clearly now, if, if we had to describe Claudia Trejos as a cigar, I would say smooth and silky. I don't know about the creamy undertone. There's always creamy undertone. <laughs> you walked into that I one. Didn't know I didn't so. <laughs> where, where can we find you on social media? Oh, eh, Claudia Trejos. So it's at Claudia Trejos on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. It's Claudia Trejos. You can't, you can't miss me. I got the funky earring. By the way, these are courtesy of my daughter, La China. And I and I had to I had to wear them. I love it. Listen, and we want to big, give out a big shout out to our boy Claudio here at Espanola Cigar Bar, opening up the doors, letting yes. us hang out here. What a great place! If you're ever in Miami Beach, and what I love about this place because the fat boy always likes to eat. You can actually eat here. I had the pulpo, I had the octopus no. for the keto boy. I crushed it here, Espanola Cigar Bar. Hook him up. Say hello to Claudio. Tell him tell him my blend sent you. Thanks for hanging out with us, my friend. Absolute pleasure. Mi hermano del alma.